Keith, I want to go back to memory truths, okay. something that you speak about in here. Because uh, personally, I always have problem with, not only personally with memory, now that I've gotten to be my age, but also uh, just in general and how we look back and try to remember things, especially for historians. Mm -hmm. So you speak of memory truths. Uh, give a brief explanation of what you mean. Well, it, when you take identity apart, uh, as people make that self-identification, there are things that, uh, in revealing that identity, that, that people will gravitate to. Uh, you, you mentioned relics. You mentioned artifacts. That's one of the first things that people will turn to, uh, is that this, this artifact is representative of who I am, and, uh, and then from that artifact comes the story, the memory truth, uh, and of course, you know, the, the picket's charge, the memory truth of, uh, of, of the high tide of the Confederacy, uh, you know, the, the, well, the famous story that uh, on the battlefield of Gettysburg, the, uh, after the park is closed, the park uh, rangers go out and police up all the Southerners who are still on the battlefield. Uh, it's never, it's never the, uh, it's always the Southerners who, who, who are still on the battlefield, still in trying to recapture that climactic moment in, in, uh, in, in Civil War history. Uh, and uh, it, it's part of that reflection, the stories that you tell, how you tell them, uh, the, the, they become the memory truths by which everyone who shares that identity nods their head and says, yes, of course, of course, I remember, yes, we all know that. And that becomes part of, of that collection of, of revelatory items that, that, that explain who people really are. Can memory truths, though, be malleable? Uh, I was taught uh, uh, as a youngster that one's own reality may transcend the truth. And especially after time, you get a chance, you, you, one sees, and maybe, and I'm wondering if this is also on the collective basis, mm -hmm. uh, not only for the individual, <coughs> that one can understand something in, in one's own reality, in one's own area, you're in a, in a pot of everyone feeling the same way, mm -hmm. but that may not really be what happened out there in actual truth if we can never get to that. But it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. What matters is what the memory truth mm -hmm. is for us who, for, for we who identify ourselves as a certain type of people. Uh, and of course you'll get it, that's where the Civil War arguments go endless, is that, yeah, you say that, but what really happened was, no, 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 that's not what really happened. You know, and that, because that's, uh, that is an issue of identity. When you challenge my memory truth, you are saying that my identity is, is, is not valid, and I will defend that. Whether it's, whether it's truthful or not, what matters is that to me, to the people who share this, it's true. Yeah, so often in Civil War history, memory and truth are two entirely different things. You know, I travel all over the country and people are involved be coming up saying, I want to tell you a story that <laughs> happened to my boy, by the way. You listen to it, you know it's, the, it's good family legend. And mm -hmm. Why bother? Let them enjoy the story. But memory and truth. I think are quite uh, distinct one from another in civil, much of civil war. Well, then let me ask you: Can some of uh, Southern identity perhaps be based on some fantasy as well? It's based on some fantasy, but as a Virginian, let me say it's also based on fact. Now, you've got to remember that Southern people are the only Americans who've ever been defeated. They're the only Americans whose land has ever been destroyed to a great degree, occupied they, by a foreign yeah, force. and they are the only Americans who Federal have ever suffered code. military occupation. Now, regardless of whether you live in the South, North, or Midwest, or Far West, that is something you, as an American, do not forget. And uh, my grandmother, bless her heart, lived to be 91, and she can still remember Union soldiers ravaging her farm mm -hmm. while her husband was off in And that memory State's has brigade. been passed through generation to generation. Well, you say, Keith, in the book that that's been muted a bit recently. Oh, yes, yes. In what way and how? Well, and why? I, I, what has happened are in, this, in the modern South uh, since the 1960s, and, and certainly you were a part of it during the Centennial Commission, is this clash between an emerging Southern identity that, that uh, I believe eclipsed the dominant Southern identity that existed uh, throughout most of the, of the 20th century. And that is the, the new identity, the new narrative that comes out of the Civil Rights Movement. 
And so uh, where you had, what when I was growing up, I mean, the Confederate flag was just, it was ubiquitous. It was just part of the, uh, of, of the life. It was just part of, of the backdrop of your life. Um, and, and other symbols related to the Confederacy. And, uh, uh, but those symbols were seen as, as the one dominant identity is eclipsed by another more modern, more homogenized identity of, in the South. Uh, the civil rights uh, narrative now has become the new memory truth of the South. And that's revealed in, in the way uh, uh, that new uh, identity is, is commemorated in Richmond, Virginia, in the capital building grounds in the Capitol grounds. The, the monuments are all related to, to Washington and the, the Confederacy, Harry F. Byrd, and now you have a monument to the Civil Rights uh, walkout uh, in uh, Prince Edward County that led to the uh, famous Brown versus Board of Education <coughs> decision. So the new monuments that are being built in the South are, are, are civil rights related. So I say that identity is muted. It hasn't gone away, but it has been certainly superseded by this more dominant uh, identity. Time has a great way to uh, de-sharpen the knives of a strong memory, and I think the passage of time has helped. Uh, I was uh, executive director of the National Civil War Centennial Commission, and uh, the feelings today are not like they were back then. It's, it's, it's a different world, uh, some positively, some negatively. Uh, on the one hand, today we've got all of this polarization taking place, which is, um, I don't think, good for the country, but it, it's happening anyway because of the environment in which we live. But I certainly think in 1965 we were a much stronger nation than we were in 61 because we remembered the past. Uh, we remembered it with honor, and we, we took uh, a, a great deal of inspiration from the survivors who would come to the battlefields for reunion and they camped in different camps for a while and soon blue and gray came together because these men realized they had survived something so much bigger than themselves that sectional animosity just evaporated in the fact that now they were all together as Americans and uh, a statement I made last night uh, generated quite a bit of interest. Uh, Johnny Rebs never apologized for what they had done but Billy Yanks never asked them to do so. And I think those guys set the tone for why we are so bound together as one people today. Well, everyone wants to. I asked this before uh, in another uh, virtual book signing that everyone wants to feel good about their ancestors. And they came up from stock that was valiant, honorable, did the right thing. And it's sometimes hard, I would think, for the Southerner to uh, get himself in line mm -hmm. with what today with mm -hmm. civil rights especially as you're saying and uh, has happened a bit to get in line with that and feel comfortable with their ancestors i'm not going to say this is analogous but uh talking about germany you know, there there's a, a area that the, the sons and daughters had to come mm -hmm. <laughs> come into conflict with what happened with their parents and grandparents and uh <laughs> they've done so to some extent I think the Southerner uh, seems to have done so as well, no? Yes, yes I, I think so, I think so. Uh, antebellum Southerners had a, had a tough time if you go back to the years before the war. Uh, they were uh, dealing with two issues that were irreconcilable. On the one hand, they, they are priding themselves in li on living in a land of liberty, but they're making money off the slave labor of three and a half million blacks, which is just incongruous. And so uh, they had to reconcile themselves with that. And then after the war, of course, they, they found solace in what's called the Lost Cause Syndrome. We fought a great honorable fight and we were overwhelmed uh, uh, by superior numbers. Uh, and that's kind of uh, fading a little bit now. It's, it's losing a lot of its eye out. Uh, and I think it's, again, it goes back to the passage of time cures a lot of ills. Uh, Keith, you talk uh, mainly about the white southerner in here. Mm -hmm. uh, I presume the black Southerner, the descendants of slaves, also had a Southern identity of their own? Well, I, I think that uh, it, it is, it is uh, well, that, again, identities, identities are, are, are created uh, and, and dominate, you know, and then they are in turn dominated by other 
identities. And that's what I think we see, is that, is that a, a, uh, a new, new Southern identity emerges after the 1960s, which is, uh, which is related to that, that civil rights struggle. And that a lot of the, the conflict that exists in, in, in the South today over symbols in South Carolina, in Mississippi, in uh, uh, Georgia about having or not having a Confederate flag somewhere or on something or related to something. Uh, each is where you see those identities clash and clash very, very bitterly. Uh, but it's, it, it's, it's not racial. Outsiders tend to see that as just oh, more of the racial problem that, that has existed in the South. But it's not. It's identity. You're taking something away from me that, that belongs to me. And if you take it away, then I am no longer authentic and I must. And, and the, natural, the natural act is to, is to oppose that. So this discussion over whether the flag is valid or, or, or you know, those different symbols uh, become flashpoints that are always under the surface. Uh, but white Southerners less and less are encouraged or uh, feel comfortable now expressing that identity because we have, I think you'll, you'll agree with me, we've oversimplified our history to the point where it's almost uh, incomprehensible. You know, those of us who teach in, in, in undergraduate uh, institutions discover how oversimplified uh, history has become to the point where uh, it, it, it's very hard sometimes to, 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 to make them appreciate that there are uh, there are deeply uh, there are deeply held uh, ideas and 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 uh, events that that shape people's thinking and shape people's lives that still continue to influence decisions about what we do in the world today. But uh, it's it's very difficult sometimes to get that across. So uh, it becomes literally black and white. The South was for slavery and and the North was not. So they had a war and that's the end. Oh well. You know, not so fast. That's the you know. beginning, actually. <laughs> yes. Let's let's talk about the larger issues, and so that's I think where we're part of our problem in America. We're a historical people, anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we oversimplify history, what we do is we tend to to associate uh, ideas in, in such a way that uh, we then suppress some ideas in order to uh, promote others. And I and I don't think that's altogether healthy in in American life, but it's. It's very much a part of of, uh, of who we are as Americans. One startling transition you, you, I've seen is that back in the centennial, many American blacks openly resented the fact that they were descended from slaves. They took umbrage at this. Now the folks out at uh, the, the great genealogical uh, uh, research uh, institution, Salt Lake City, tell me they are being flooded with requests from blacks who want to be able to say they were descended from slaves. Look how far we've come. And that to me is just a major transition. Well, the centennial was totally different than yes. that. Yes. And you were, you know, part of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so was our Ralph Newman. Yes, uh, very began much Began so. our shop. And I know you knew him. I was going to show uh, our logo that came from Carl Sandburg. This is close to what our logo looks like today. Carl Sandburg is the one who actually propelled Ralph Newman to begin the shop as Abraham Lincoln Bookshop.